Um, I'm Andy. I'm the archaeology training officer for uh, for the North. Wrong way. Uh, and I am going to be talking about Hoik. Looks like Howick, but produced Hoik, and it's on a rocky piece of foreshore uh, on Northumberland, roughly about two kilometres long, from Sugar Sands in the south to the ominously named Pig's Hole um, in the north. Um, I have absolutely no idea why it's called Pig's Hole, and I don't really want to find out, but it's a horrible little place. Um, in the prehistoric, uh, the sea level was significantly lower than it is today, and what is a rocky piece of foreshore now would have been rolling uh, forests with hills, and on the cliffs above the beach was a Mesolithic hut which was excavated in the early noughties where they found 13,000 pieces of prehistoric flint. Um, on the beach itself is a prehistoric submerged forest, um, which was first identified in 1922, um, but is actually fairly difficult to find. Um, so this is Megan, um, our outreach officer in the north, and two of our volunteers, desperately looking for the prehistoric forest, um, and failing miserably to find it on this occasion. Um, it's taken us four goes to go and find it on a piece of foreshore which is about the size um, of this lecture theatre. Um, in 1922, it was identified as having alder, oak, birch, beech, and fir tree, um, which I'm slightly surprised about because I've never really come across fir tree in submerged forests before, but there you go. Um, it hasn't been dated, so one of the things we're hoping to do is go back and date it, but when it was discovered, it was thought to be either Mesolithic or Bronze Age, which is quite a large gap, um, but we're thinking probably Mesolithic, to go along with the hut above it. Um, in the medieval period, this area would have hummed with activity. There are about half a dozen small sandstone quarries which were used to build whopping big things like this up at the top. This is the lovely Bambra Castle, and it's all made out of this sandstone, which you can see uh, the tool marks down here. And then this um, fairly miserable photograph, which was taken on a lovely sunny day, <coughs> um, is actually one of the little harbours which they used to move the sandstone out of. And to make it, they've cut a big patch out of the sandstone and they moved boats in and out of it and then uh, out to bigger boats out onto the uh, deeper water. In the 18th and 19th century, uh, this is Sugar Sands, um, a much nicer beach to play on. On the 18th and 19th century, the Earl Greys used this section of beach to move timber out of their estate uh, up and down the coast. And it has all sorts of industrial remains on it, including shear leg bases, so they're a small uh, tripod type crane, um, and this sandstone feature here, um, which I have absolutely no idea what it is. Um, so if anybody recognises this sort of feature, and would like to tell me, that would be fantastic. Um, it's a sandstone feature made out of curved blocks. So we're wondering whether it's some sort of barge bed, maybe, or somewhere that you can rebuild ships. I know there's a lot of this sort of thing on the Thames, so if there are any frogs in the audience who recognise something like that, please do come and tell me afterwards, because I'd really like to know what it is. Um, this regal-looking gentleman is Charles Gray, second Earl Grey, uh, third Baronet Hoyt, and he was Prime Minister from 1830 to 1834. Um, he went to Eton and had a horrible, terrible time at Eton and promised that he would never, ever subject his 16 kids to <laughs> private school education. I think he was making a football team, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so, what do you do if you're one of the wealthiest men in England and you've got 16 kids to entertain? Well, quite obviously, you cut them a swimming pool into the foreshore. So this feature down here is about 8 metres by 4 metres and is a small pool where his 16 kids would go and paddle. Um, it would have heated up a lot quicker than the sea in the summertime and would have been nice and safe to actually go and swim in. Um, around the site, behind it, there are a series of post holes and iron hooks which they built a tent on top of and I'm actually sat back here somewhere on a nice rock cut bench while Meg does all of the hard work interpreting the feature. Um, 
being a prime minister, um, he decided that a tent wasn't good enough for himself. So he had a uh, cottage up here, which was uh, converted into a bathing house and had a private swimming pool cut into the rocks down here so nobody else could see him having splish splash. Um, there is a third swimming pool uh, on the beach down here. This is about half a kilometre away from the actual bathing house, but is very similar with a set of rock cut steps down into a bottom of it, little ledge around the side for people to sit in. And we're not quite sure whether this was cut for the family, whether it was cut for workers, something like that. Um, in the 20th century, it had a significantly more grisly uh, history. So these are two Scandinavian boats which got wrecked within two days of each other in 1913. The Bulmer lifeboat got everybody off these. Um, this, however, is the G14. Um, the G14 wasn't actually wrecked at Hoyk. Its sister ship, the G11, was wrecked at Hoyk. She was a First World War submarine which was wrecked uh, 10 days after the armistice. This is her, uh, not looking particularly well. Uh, she ran aground in a fog bank because the commanding officer of her was used to a different submarine, which was smaller and slowed down faster. Um, so he got a bit of a shock when it ran into the foreshore. And unfortunately, as they were evacuating the crew, two members of the crew uh, died, uh, and the stoker's body has never been recovered. Um, now it's just a collection of bits of brass on the foreshore. There's an escape hatch uh, tucked away in here, and there's some steel plating. Um, it's in bits because it was blown up by the MOD in the 1920s to prevent people stealing lots of submarine technology out of it. Um, perhaps, the, so uh, this, sorry, is the K-15, which was also um, commanded by George Bradshaw, and that sunk as well. So it doesn't have too much of a good reputation when it comes to submarines. Um, perhaps the most tragic wreck on the site, though, is a French trawler called the Tadorn, <coughs> which was wrecked in 1913. Um, tragic because it had a crew of 30, 25 were got off by the Bulmer lifeboat. Um, unfortunately, five died, including this one young lad who was lashed to the mast to uh, keep him safe, and unfortunately he drowned whilst he was lashed to the mast. Um, now it is a collection of hole plating and a big uh, scotch boiler. This is the wrong way round. It's been turned up onto its top as it was being salvaged and people were cutting the insides out <coughs> to get at all the brasswork. Uh, so it's an interesting section of coast with lots happening on it for about 5,000 years. Um, Thank you very much. We'll, we'll move um, quickly on to Megan, uh, also from to North, uh, who will um, give us a flavour of the work she's been doing, and then we'll take questions on the North afterwards. Thank you. Oh, wrong way. Right, so we're going to hop over to the other <coughs> side, the other coast. Me and Andy look after two coasts. So we're going to the west coast, back over there, um, and we're going to look at a site um, on the Sefton coast, which is this bit here, uh, between Southport up here and Liverpool down here. It's this bit that sticks out. Some of you might have heard of Hot Farmby before. It's a um, site of some amazing mesolithic footprints that Steph showed us earlier. Um, but we're not going to be looking at them. <laughs> we're going to be looking at something else. So. Um, in the north, we've tried really, really hard to get young people and children more involved in this project. Um, so we started working with the local Young Archaeologists Club. So for those of you who don't know who the Young Archaeologists Club are, um, they're the youth group that the Council of British Archaeology run. Um, there's 70 branches across the whole of the UK, um, and they're run for children between the ages of 8 and 16 years old. Um, they're, this is the only youth group in the country, basically, that caters for children who have an interest in archaeology and heritage. Um, and it's entirely run by volunteers. I run, myself and Louise from Walker Bay, both run the Legion Archaeology Club. If any of you want to get involved, please come and talk to us. Because <laughs> we'd love more volunteers. So, 
So this is some of the stuff we did. We started by visiting local ones. Uh, we visited the Leeds branch, the York branch, the Sheffield branch, which are well-known coastal sites, um, <laughs> and also the Newcastle branch. And we decided that we were going to pitch this as um, intertidal skills that can be used on terrestrial sites. So some of the activities we did was risk assessment. We talked to them about risks. Now, I haven't yet seen any sharks on any of our sites. I want to keep it that way. <laughs> but obviously sharks, uh, jellyfish, quicksand, tides, getting kids to understand what the risks are when you're going out on site. Um, we also did uh, fines handling. So this is Leeds. Uh, handling stuff that you might find on the foreshore, which might be very familiar to lots of you frogs. And then this, our portable foreshore. Now, if you can't take the children to the foreshore, you bring the foreshore to the children. <laughs> and this is what we decided to do. So this is our portable foreshore, our submerged forest, our um, fish trap, and our anchor chain. And we used offset planning. We taught children, um, as young as eight, basically, to offset plan. Nice and easy. And finally, um, this is... Um, <laughs> This is our spaghetti bridge for, um, for the Newcastle Yak. Um, we were teaching them about the chronology of bridges across the time, so we decided to build um, a spaghetti bridge. So we decided this was so successful, we were having so much, um, so much success with um, going to young archaeologist clubs that we decided we would actually run a young archaeologist club leaders weekend. So these are all our lovely leaders. Uh, TDP showing you there, Josh representing, Lara, myself, and Andy's over here. So we decided, yeah, this is an annual uh, weekend which is set up every year to um, train uh, volunteers at the United Archaeologist Club different skills um, and, and teach them something. So we turned up on a, a sunny day in May. It's always sunny in the north, in the north, uh, in the north basically. <laughs> um, and um, South Spot became overrun with young archaeologist leaders. So where did they all come from? Of the 70 branches that there are across the UK, uh, we had 24 represented um, and 34 leaders. 19 of these were English, uh, two were Scottish, two were Welsh, and one was all the way from the Channel Islands, which is not on this map, <laughs> it's so far away. Um, but out of these, um, sort of, out of these seven, uh, 24 branches, only six could probably be considered actually being coastal. That's Kilmartin, Bangor, Glamorgan, Mersey and Dee, Devon, Torbay and Jersey. The rest of them aren't coastal. So why did they come? It's because we pitched it as a transferable skill. All the offset planning that they learn can be used on terrestrial sites. All the fines handling can be used on terrestrial sites. But we were teaching them this through the medium of intertidal and coastal archaeology. Uh, since then, um, some of the local groups, so York have... Um, York Yak have come and done a coastal archaeology at Bridlington. Um, and... Canterbury and Sussex are planning on going out with uh, Team South East <laughs> at some point in the near future. So what are the sort of things we did with them? We structured the weekend in two bits. The first one is this bit, one of my favourite sites. This is the Formby Lifeboat Station. This is the um, first purpose-built lifeboat station in the country, so it's pretty special. Um, and we decided we were going to take them out and do some offset planning. Now, for some of them, this was a bit like sucking eggs. If you're a professional archaeologist, you know how to do this with your... Um, or, you know, a, a, an experienced frog, you probably know how to do this in your sleep, with your eyes shut. But some of these people did. <coughs> so we went out and we, we had a go at offset re recording. The next bit was um, in, in indoor activities to teach, um, to teach them stuff about intertidal and coastal archaeology. So we did... Activities like this one, making alum crystals to teach them about the alum industry in the north, uh, the Yorkshire coast. Uh, floating an egg, which they would have um, done in salt making. If your brine was strong enough and it, an egg could float on it, then it's done. And making your own mesolithic formby footprints and recording them. Uh, um, we also did timelines of famous ship, which I'm sure, ships, which I'm sure Elliot would have loved. So we produced this. We produced five sessions. Um, were designed with 49 activities. Uh, these were sessions on an introduction to intertidal archaeology, waterlogged contexts, coastal industries, um, the seaside, and ships and boats. Um, along with this, we created a 140-page booklet on features which you might, might be found on the foreshore. Um, this might be useful to everybody. This is, this is um, the page we did on clinker-built and carvel-built vessels. 
There's stuff um, on footprints, on trackways, on salt making, on alum making, um, basically anything you're going to find on the coast. Um, and all the activities come with it. So this is a hazard identifying, this is risk assess uh, making risk assessments fun, basically. <laughs> um, and this is all freely available for yak leaders, for teachers, um, for home educated um, people, for, for basically anyone who wants it on the yak website. So if you're interested, have a look. Um, so, so round of the weekend we finished it by visiting another site, this is High Town um, in Mersey, uh, Merseyside, um, which is a lovely um, submerged forest, um, which has the remains of bats trees, um, and you found acorn cups eroding out of the peat there, um, allegedly you can also find um, fir needles and stuff like that. So we thought by rounding it off we'd just show them some more internal archaeology. So I'm going to do a little bit of statistics now, beautiful pie chart. <laughs> Um, some interesting stuff came out of this. In regards to the leader's relationship to archaeology, 35% were professional archaeologists, um, which is no surprise. 23% ticked other, and one of them said they were a creator and a conservator. Uh, conservator. So that's, that's fine. The interesting statistic for me is this 19%. This is people who tick general interest. That's people with no formal background in archaeology um, who are coming along and getting involved <coughs> getting involved with it. 10% were students, and 13% identified themselves as amateur archaeologists. Um, the other th interesting thing was the age groups that came out. 21 uh, members were under the age of 55. The largest demographic who came were 26 to 36, which is quite unusual in the projects. And only 10 of those were over the age of 55. So it's a very different group to what you and you're mainly working with when it comes to volunteers. So we, what did you, we asked them, as part of our evaluation, what did you enjoy most about, about the event? Most people said stuff like uh, meeting other leaders, but being near the seaside, new ideas, um, a different type of archaeology. Um, I like this one at the bottom, the site visits of Formula Lifeboat Station. <laughs> um, and, and citizen structured exercises that they could then take back to the young archaeologists and use them. It's great feedback and it, it, it worked, it, the, it's working to broaden people's idea of what archaeology is um, and to pass everything that they've learnt on to their children who, in essence, are the future of archaeology. Um, so that's a very quick um, round-up of a, of a Yak Leaders Weekend that we held. So, yeah, thank you.